All right. Well, right now, uh, nice. Theology on Tap Houston's friends are getting notified that we're on Facebook Live and we're uh, doing a kind of a rare, I guess, Monday 530 mm -hmm. debate slash conversation. Uh, so those of you in your drive home or, you know, cooking, I don't know, sauteing onions right now or something in your kitchen, <laughs> you're like, oh, well, I'll listen to this while I'm doing this. Great. Glad to have you. Um, we're basically talking about the soul tonight. We've got two special guests, two Christian philosophers with us to do that. So uh, if everyone's ready, I'm going to jump in with the formal way. How's it sound on Facebook? We're good? Oh, I have my sound off, but we oh, okay. look amazing. Okay, as long as we look good. That's all right. Okay. I, I, the sound <laughs> should be matters. fine. So, all right, well, let's go. Does the soul exist? Oh, scratch that. We, okay. we, we've already had that debate. Let me start over. We actually have a much more nuanced conversation and debate uh, today to ask two Christian philosophers, which is really what kind of soul do we have? Uh, or are we souls? Or are we souls and bodies? When do we get a soul? Does its existence uh, rely on our physical bodies? And what does that say about what happens when we die? Does this topic offer any commentary on other issues like transgenderism or abortion or near-death experiences? Evan Frisk and Eric Hernandez, they join us for a Christian v. Christian conversation today mm -hmm. around the nature of the soul on today's Theology on Air. I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor at First Lutheran here in Houston. With me, as always, is Sarah, who is the outreach director for young adult Sarah Stone at Memorial Drive hey. Presbyterian Church. And so, and our guests are uh, Evan Frisk, uh, philosophy professor at HCC, Houston mm -hmm. Community College here in Houston, happens to be a member of my church. So <laughs> I, I recruited him a long time ago. And uh, Eric Hernandez, who's done a number of debates at our church, but now is with the Texas Baptist, is it Texas Baptist Association? Uh, the the long name is the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Okay, but Texas and Baptist are, for short. And you're chief apologist for them. Yep, apologetics lead. Yes, sir. Apologetics lead. All right. Um, and uh, anyway, both you guys have made this soul um, a I don't know a topic of yours, a, a study of yours. So um, Eric, I'll nominate you to go first, just to kind of. Um, and let me know if I'm forgetting something, but just kind of lay out a case very briefly, you know, that the soul exists. And by the way, we did a whole interview with Eric on this topic. So if you're listening, you know, you can find that on Facebook and on YouTube and on our podcast feed, the Algae on Air, of course, by the way, like us, subscribe to us on YouTube and like us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. So every time we do one of these, you get that, but maybe just, um, Lay out the case for, yeah, we have a soul, but what kind of a soul it is maybe in four to five minutes, and then Evan will come back, and then we'll start to argue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, like I said, Eric Hernandez, uh, apologetically, protect his Baptist. Well, technically not a philosopher, aspiring philosopher, so not yet, but I, I do appreciate the kind words. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd take four or five minutes, but basically, um, I could just refer people back to, to the other conversation we had, but... Uh, so I'm what you call a substance dualist, and in in a nutshell, it's basically the view that I am a soul. So when I use the word I, that's an indexical word which refers to something, kind of like using the word here or there. And when I use the word I, that indexical word is referring to me, the self, the subject, and I would say that is the soul. So I don't, quote, have a soul, but rather I am a soul and I have a body. And cue the joke about my car because I do have a soul. It's a Kia soul. It's orange in my driveway, um, and, <laughs> and uh, um, so I am a soul. Now I also hold there, there's various versions of substance dualism, um, and I would even say that hylomorphism, which is what uh, Evan would hold to, I would even say is a version of substance dualism. But basically, I hold to also what's what's known as uh, more specifically a Thomistic. What I've heard J.P. Moreland call a Thomistic like substance dualism. He calls himself a peeping Thomist. And this goes into uh -huh. uh, a much, much deeper metaphysics with regards to what's uh, a notion known as organicism. And in a nutshell, and we can get into the weeds of that uh, as we go into the discussion, that it is the soul that is responsible for uh, driving the DNA and forming the body. So um, it's been said that it is the function determines form. So whatever functions and capacities that my soul has, it is going to, uh, in a law-like way, develop and form a body in order to utilize the capacities that it has. So whatever body that I have is going to give you an indication of the type of soul and the capacities that I have within my soul. So you can think of it like if I put a blanket over an object, well, I cannot see 
the object underneath the blanket, I can see the form that the blanket takes. And I would say similarly in that, in that kind of analogy, that is what my body is, the soul. Um, the, the soul, again, going back to Moreland, he, I've heard him say that the soul is an external realization of an internal structure. I mean, excuse me, the body is an external realization of an internal structure. Um, arguments for the soul, again, referring people back to the other uh, episode that we did. I, when I argue for the soul, I argue two basic points. One, that consciousness is not physical. And then there has to be something that possesses the conscious states and properties. Well, I know for sure that I am conscious. So then the question naturally arises, if consciousness is not physical, but these states and properties of consciousness exist, then, then what am I? And then we basically would draw it down to, um, if I were talking, usually talk with a lot of atheists, I'd say I'm either a purely physical object or an immaterial substance. Uh, that's how I define the soul as an immaterial substance that is the possessor of consciousness and animates the body. Um, so that being said, if I'm not reducible or identical to my brain and body, then I'm something more, namely a soul. And those are the two points I would go to to give a cumulative case for the soul. Um, trying to think anything else relevant. Can I jump I, I think, in and clarify yeah, something? Because we've already said like 16 words. I don't know. Um, not really, but, uh, when you say substance dualism, tell our audience for those people that don't geek out on this kind of stuff, what do you mean by substance dualism? People know dual means like two, but what is that? Because Evan's going to kind of come back against that a little bit. So help us understand what it is to begin with. Uh, yeah. So like a, a good question. So like I said, there are various uh, flavors of substance dualism, but like I said, dualism basically means twoism. And it would be helpful to make a distinction here between, let's say, a strip, strict physicalism, which would be the view that human beings are purely physical uh, uh, properties and parts. Everything about a human being is physical. And then you have a property dualism, where now the twoism is regards to the properties. Not only do human beings possess physical properties, but also mental properties, which would be taken to be immaterial. That would be property dualism. Then you have substance dualism which is a view that not only are there two different properties, something physical and something mental, but the thing that possesses the mental properties would be an immaterial substance. So uh, technically, I would also I'd, I'd go on to clarify that the body in itself is not a substance. It's, it's, not a, it's not a substantial whole in itself. It's an aggregate of parts. What is an aggregate? It's a collection of separable parts held together in a certain structure. So the body is not a substantial whole. It is an aggregate. But Traditionally speaking, it's seen as a form of substance dualism because it's the soul. And then you have this, uh, you could even say, and I'm sure everyone would agree with this, it's, uh, com there's a composite with the body. So my soul is deeply integrated with, with my body. Um, one other thing that would be uh, useful here would be that on my view, this is where it gets a little bit hefty with the terminology, uh, especially if you're not familiar with it, the soul is ontologically prior to the body, which means that the body is grounded in the soul. It's not uh, that the uh, soul is grounded in the body. Um, again, I can go into more detail than that. A quick example. Well, no, I'll for now, over. I think we probably want to give Evan a chance, but let me, let me give my fourth grader reaction and see if I kind of understand you so that then when Evan goes, I kind of know where, where we are. You're saying that the body and the soul are two separate things that are inextricably linked, but they are separate in substance, even though the body is an aggregate, it's we're, we're calling it a substance for the purpose of our conversation. Yeah, and, so I wouldn't say they're separate. Well, okay. so, uh, so I would say they're distinct um, okay. because separate can, can have some, some load, uh, have be a loaded term, but True. yeah, they're distinct. Okay, Evan, why don't you tell us before, so we got to hear a little bit more of Eric's story in our podcast with him, but maybe tell us a little bit about how you became interested in this topic. Why does it even matter? And then maybe where you agree and disagree with Eric, and then we'll get crazy. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've always kind of just been interested in philosophy. Uh, I didn't know it was called that until I was like well into college. Um, but I have odd memories of being like nine and trying to figure out how we could see angels because light needs to bounce off of bodies in order to enter our eyes. And so seeing as most nine year olds them, do. Like, does, yeah. yeah, right. As most nine year olds do. I was a strange <laughs> child. Um, seeing them is, it was just an odd turn of phrase for me. And then I was very skeptical about different kinds of, um, things that I'll, I'll now kind of call superstitions. Uh, mm -hmm. as I'm older, I was skeptical of this, uh, through, um, um, through my childhood and then, 
uh, into an adult and now kind of for, formed by it. Um, I uh, uh, was interested in the soul as well, just because I was I was interested in trying to understand death. And that's just seems to be very intricate into the religion. Um, Christianity, it doesn't seem to shy away from death as a topic. And so I kind of dived into it as we got into it in church and catechism and things like that. Okay. Um, so you were a nine-year-old kid that wondered how we could see angels and you were consumed by death. So great. Did you, right. did yes. you ever torture cats or squirrels? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> no, no, I never tortured cats and squirrels. I gave, I helped uh, uh, dogs give birth. So quite the opposite, I okay. think. Like, right. <laughs> okay, but continue. So tell us kind of how you line up with Eric and then where you diverge and then why should we even care? Yeah, so yeah. I, I think Eric and I are gonna have a lot of commonalities. Um, the We both put emphasis on the soul as part of the value, um, the the access to, to, to truth um, or value is going to come through the soul. Consciousness is, is part of the soul. Um, that uh, proof for the souls, like we'll often use the same arguments even and how we do this. Um, we're just going to have a number of, of subtle differences that I think make big impacts mm. um, as we keep going, rolling down the road. Um, it's like we're, we're so far upstream that when the river divides, like we just end up in totally different places um, by the end of it. So mm. um, the things we're going to disagree on is things like definition of a person and definition of a soul, which is just way upstream and uh, uh, often things that people don't care to pay attention to. Uh, but I think ultimately they're going to matter. Um, the position that I hold is called hylomorphism. Uh, it's Aristotle's position. And uh, I even try to pull closer to Aristotle than Aquinas. And so that's going to be ultimately our, kind of our difference here. Thomas Aquinas uh, being the, the, uh, the 13th century um, philosopher. Um, I, uh, um, so I, I would reject actually the idea that there are two substances. And that's the, the big difference. There are not two substances. There's one, and that one substance is body and soul. So it, it ends up having a it's kind a package of package deal. Yeah, it's a package deal. Okay. So it has a flavor of dualism to it in that way, um, if we want to call it that. But historically, that's never been the name just because uh, it's uh, it was intentionally written against Plato, who seems to be kind of one of the like the Greek father of a lot of this. Um, the um, the, the easy way to explain it is just Aristotle understood the world through cause and effect and that anything that exists um, um, is explained through causes. Um, they're dependent or contingent on those causes. So for example, let's take uh, today's uh, MLK Jr. Day. So let's take a statue of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, first, I need some sort of material to make the, the statue out of. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to go with marble um, and marble does not exist, then I can't make this statue. Mm -hmm. So that the statue's existence depends on the existence of marble at the same time. Gotcha. Um, the, I have to shape it in a very particular way, and that's called the formal cause. Uh, I need uh, to be, uh, I am the, the agent cause because I would be the artist for this statue. Uh, and then uh, I need some sort of significance. So if MLK Jr. sat around his house and did nothing all day, I wouldn't be making a statue of him. I'd be making a statue of somebody else. Sure. So all of these things end up mattering uh, in explaining the existence of this object. Um, and so I simply say, when we talk about the human person, the analogy will hold um, that what is my material cause? And that's going to be the, the carbon and hydrogen that make up my body, right? But I don't have a monopoly on that. I mean, dogs are made of carbon and hydrogen too. Mm -hmm. So what I need is a very specific form. Uh, and that same form is the same kind of form that I'm talking about with statues. Um, the I would say the statue isn't technically a substance, but the analogy would hold um, what I'm that the human person uh, needs both. And so I would, it, it, for... Um, souls to only exist or for bodies only to exist, I would ask you to imagine a statue that's made of nothing or <laughs> uh, a statue shaped like nothing. And neither of these are possible. They're just, they're inextricably connected so that I have causal relation between them. And um, I think that philosophically that gives me the uh, a number of different conclusions. And that's really where we're going to start dividing. Okay, so if there are kind of three stances on thinking through the soul, one, we're not representing here today physicalism, which is just the soul is just sort of this like uh, emergent property of the of the mind. Mm -hmm. There's nobody here saying that. Eric is saying substance dualism. There's something distinct between the immaterial and the material, not separate. And you're saying sort of when I hear you talk, it makes me think of when people talk about the Trinity. It's hard to wrap your mind around. It's like <laughs> they're one, but also not one. 
Um, but say the name of yours again. Hylomorphism. It literally just means matter form because I think that everything needs matter and form. Okay, so they can't be, there's no distinction. They have to be. They, yeah, they, they're required to be together. Otherwise, whatever we're talking about doesn't even exist. So okay. like unicorns. Like we can talk about the form of unicorns all day. They're white, they poop glitter. Like the, we can talk <laughs> about that, but, but there's no matter to them. Yeah. And therefore they don't exist. So you say. So I say. But if they did, <laughs> they'd have a soul. We all agree on that, apparently. <laughs> Actually, well, yeah, we'll get into that later. So if anyone is not really into this kind of stuff, but for some reason they're still listening, maybe they're cutting those onions and they can't get to the phone deposit because- They're this, already crying. So, like, <laughs> for some know, reason yeah. or another. Why does this matter? So I think it runs into the exact kind of problems that Evan opened up with. Um, You're Evan. Oh, yeah, this yeah. Evan. Uh, this, this oh, Evan. okay. Yes, this Evan. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the, the big ones, I think, would be abortion. Um, the, there is a long history, centuries of history, uh, about when does the soul enter the, the fetus. Hmm. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas actually said that it, there was no soul until 40 days. Because at 40 days is when you get activity, self-motivated, like self-movement. Um, and actually, it, w if we listen to, to Eric right at the beginning, he does even talk about how the soul is animating the body. It's, it is Thomas Aquinas's argument. Um, but it, the argument is then that abortion would be fine for the first 39 days, according to Thomas Aquinas. Because hmm. there is no soul there. There's no person that you would be, that you would be killing at the very least. And so it, it opens to the door to things like this. Uh, I think there's a couple of, of good examples of where uh, Eric has to answer the question yeah. of how do you know the, the soul happens uh, with the body? Um, and I get to say that, that, of course, they happen together. Like, how could I argue otherwise? And that's so, my definition yeah. of the thing. Eric, I mean, we have a Disney movie out there right now saying that souls are just kind of hanging out and waiting to be put in bodies. I don't think either of you espouses that. But what what say you about souls and babies? And, and is there a implication for abortion yeah so so uh, um uh, on my view if you note in the beginning i said so i hold to a, a traducing view of the soul and mentioned the notion of organicism so on my view uh and another notion i did mention was that the soul is ontologically prior to the body so the body is grounded in the soul and the function of the soul is what's going to determine the form of the body so that being said on my view there is no body without a soul so from the beginning, from inception, you have a soul, and it is actually the soul that is driving the body and the development of the body. So I would reject that part of, of Aquinas' argument about the first 40 days. Um, so from on my view, from the beginning, from the get-go, you have a soul that is driving the formation of the body. So there, it makes no sense on my view to say, when does the soul enter the body? When the soul is the very thing that is driving and developing the body using the, the information and tools available to it, such as DNA. Okay, can I jump in real fast? Okay, so, so you said soul is ontologically prior to the body. So would you say that, say my soul, for example, it, it existed prior to my body existing ontologically. So it didn't exist like somewhere in space, but like in, in God's mind or something like that, it existed. Hmm. Well, yeah, it, so, so it, good. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So as I say, good question, <clears throat> and, and that'd be important to unpack. So when, when I say ontologically, we're, we're not talking um, about uh, a temporally prior. It's not as if it came like, uh, and then one second later, the body was. Ontological prior just means that uh, in terms of what comes first. So for example, um, if, if I, to, to make a distinction here between a, a substance versus like an aggregate, if I remove a tire from a car, the existence and identity of a tire stays the same, which shows us that it, its existence and identity is not dependent or, or necessarily uh, uh, dependent on its relation to the car as a whole. Contrast that with, um, with, with me as a substance. If you cut off my arm, as Aristotle said, it will lose its identity as a human arm, which is evident by the fact that in a few days it will cease to exist. So for substances, the parts are dependent on the whole. So in that sense, uh, in order for my parts to exist, I as a whole have to exist. Contrast that with purely physical objects. A tire can exist independent of the whole. So for purely physical objects like a car or watch or Lego bricks, the parts are ontologically prior. They exist prior to the whole, whereas with substances, those, the substance as a whole has to exist ontologically prior to its parts. Okay. So Evan, does that satisfy your concern about 
um, substance dualism, you know, I, I guess it, you think it, there's a problem with abortion there because if, if the soul and body are not together, but he's saying that they are anyway. Is that yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it gets, I think it pushes it back a step ultimately. Um, but I don't know if it solves the problem. So we've, we've now posited organicism as to help redeem, um, uh, substance dualism from some of these, these fatal flaws, I think. Um, but now we need arguments for, well, how do you know that organicism is true? Um, what, what do you mean when you say organicism? Uh, it's uh, one of Eric's terms. It links the body to the soul so that the soul produces the body. Um, I would think that there's a number of examples that I could say of bodies that don't have souls like statues. The, those are clearly bodies like they, the, they're physical objects in the world. Um, and to say like, how do you know, like, why would they not have souls, but we do and try to dive into that kind of, of argument. And um, specifically with abortion, like how do we know that this fetus has a soul and, but this fetus doesn't, um, it starts to get into exactly that question. So I think we've only pushed it back a step. We now just need to argue about how do you know that the body and soul are, are always linked in this way? Hmm. And as soon as you do, I think we end up with hylomorphism. Like we just, <laughs> we just end up with the body with the and form and matter. And I can clearly connected. not drink the wine in front of you. <laughs> okay. Do you I'm going to try to ask some quick questions as we go to, do you disagree with the statement that the soul is ontologically prior to the body? Um, yes. So I would think that um, the shape of the statue bef existing before the material doesn't make any sense. So would you oh. say that at conception, the soul comes into existence? Like it didn't exist at all Correct. ontologically or any way before. Yeah. That. And actually that's uh, uh, theologically that you look at church history and the soul existing prior to the body is a condemned heresy. Oh, um, snap. That is a, a thing that's actually there. It's one of the reasons that Roman Catholics um, end up diving into Aquinas so much. Eric just he's fine with so. that. <laughs> he's, all right, go he's for like, it, Eric. Okay, call me you brought, you brought up the H word, yeah. So so <laughs> rem remember, it's it's ontologically prior, not terribly I'm going to pause prior. you for a second yeah. because you all have used that word six times and the average Joe does not what, know what ontological is. Tell us what ontological is. Uh, so ontology has to do with the ground of being or existence. Uh, so... Uh, maybe a quick illustration would be my, in order for my thoughts to exist, that is Eric Hernandez, in order for Eric Hernandez's thoughts to exist, I have to exist as a conscious subject. So I am the ontological grounding for my thoughts and all my mental states. Without me, there is no Eric's thoughts. So okay. in that sense, yeah, I ontologically ground my mental state. Thank states. you. You can go back to heresy now. I mean, <laughs> well, telling us why. You real don't. quick, yeah. I actually I use an example when I, I teach students. Uh, I don't actually teach the word ontological at all in my classes. Uh, I'm uh, in, only teaching the 1,000 and 2,000 little. But in talking, I, I'll say like what happens or what what's necessary first. Um, does motion come first or friction? And it's, you have to have, like friction can't exist without the motion yeah. in the first place. So like one comes before the other, but clearly like chronologically they're happening at the same time. Um, but as far as like when we're the talking- The necessity of it. Yeah, so there's, okay. there's a kind of like logical necessity of one coming first, but it has nothing to do with time. Right, it's not temporally first, but sort of functionally first or yeah, something. Yeah, something okay. closer to that. But Eric, so tell why, us why you're not a heretic. Yeah, I wanna why, make sure he gets- you, Why do you object to what? Eric says then, if, so, he's, if he's only talking about an ontological. Yeah, yeah so what the when heck? You, when you said before, <laughs> I actually thought you meant chronologically. Oh, so, okay, yeah. okay. Well, I said ontological. Oh, did you? I missed it then, yeah. my bad. Then, okay, I, I just, because, <laughs> I, no, I'm just trying to pin down like, yeah, where you guys are different. Okay, but, okay. What, what about some of the other issues? Unless Eric wanted to say more on what, I don't want to, I don't uh, want to yeah, all. yeah. Well, I mean, just that clarification, and then uh, uh, because he kind of threw out some some like challenging questions, which, which are which are great, uh, but of course, you know, can only cover so much at once. Um, uh, given the the organicism thing, I think there's there's lots of things to back that up, but we can come back to that if you want. But I, I noticed so a few things that were down. He said that um, like statue depends on the marble so if there's no marble no statue on his view the human person necessarily it seems to entail a soul and body so if there's no body then there is no person well then i would say you're giving up the intermediate state there because there's no body yet i think the bible is clear that there is an intermediate state um and then you said what about a, a statue what? it's like, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry so like when you the intermediate state would be what we die our body is dead it's in the ground but we're still living in Christ, I mean, and then we have all these yeah. debates about paradise and Hades and heaven and hell and all that. But you're saying there's the intermediate state would be between our physical death and our glorious resurrection. 
Yeah, so so John Cooper uh, um, has a lot of great stuff on this. Uh, who's a scholar who who dives into the text on on dualism, and he said he he talks about the the Pharisees having this two step eschatological view to where their belief in the resurrection also went hand in hand in an intermediate, a conscious intermediate state. So this is a, a, a period of disembodiment. I think this is also what Paul alludes to when he talks about. Um, being in a state of nakedness without a body. Now, I would say, and I'm sure Evan would agree, that being embodied is the most natural state for a soul to be in. But again, I would I would argue philosophically and biblically that the Bible does speak of a, uh, again, what Paul talks about, a, a, a period of nakedness where one can exist disembodied. Hmm. Um, he, when he talked about the statue, he said, well, that's a body, does it have a soul? So, so to clarify, uh, obviously we're talking about biological organisms uh, mm -hmm. as substances. So a statue isn't a biological organism, it's just a physical object. So if he's gonna say without marble, there's no statue, he's gonna have to say without a body, there's no person. But I, I think, you're, again, you're gonna be giving up intermediate state. And then of course, mm -hmm. angels are persons, God is a person, yet he has no body. So there's no matter going on there. So what's the matter, Evan? With oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> puns, puns are the best. All right, so um, I uh, uh, the, I went to school for philosophy, but honestly, my passion has always been towards theology. I just like the the philosophical route. So I, th this is a, um, the reason I'm here. Um, I would think that actually the Bible says otherwise, and that in fact, uh, uh, there, uh, we, there is no, or the intermediate state is not what the large majority of modern Christians think it is. Uh, and this is where I think that most people will think that I'm a physicalist. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to get there. I'm real getting quick. ready to take a drink. Cause I know so, it's coming. It's like your so passion. It's baby. my passion. This is my baby. So, um, there are uh, a number of verses that I would think point to this. Uh, but the, the big ones would be that the wages of sin are death. Um, and that applies to the person. And even if like we are souls, that means your soul will die. Um, <gasps> That sounds super awkward, but you awkward. look at that, like that's Ro Romans 6, 23. And then we, we can go to backwards to uh, Ezekiel 18, 4. And it says the soul that sins shall die. We go backwards again hmm. to, to Genesis 2. And it says, uh, e eat of the fruit and you will die. Hmm. Surely you will die. So it's, it's using that indexed I. It's using exactly, the, regardless of how we define it, we have to die. And so I would think the intermediate state, uh, we, we still exist, but we don't function. That's not a thing. There is, there is no conscious intermediate state. But, and that's but if why Evan that, believes in soul sleep. Yeah, so it's titled soul sleep. Um, that's often confused with annihilationism, <laughs> which is what I don't hold. I do think that, that things exist so that when we die, and this is my, uh, my focus on, on death, right? Um, the, the body <laughs> doesn't cease to exist. Uh, clearly, the, the hydrogen and carbon is still there. It doesn't poof into nothing. Um, uh, uh, the soul likewise does the same. Uh, what we get is a corpse uh, and the, the soul no longer functions and neither does the body. Hmm. But, but it That's seems like it, uh, with, with all due respect, and, and if I say with all due respect, I can say whatever I want. As long That's as right. I it's like no offense. Anything that no. follows is fine. No offense, uh, so, so it sounds like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth when you're saying oh. that the body and, and soul is needed for the person, but then you're going to say that, that without the body, the soul exists, but it just doesn't function. Well, then you have a soul that is existing without a body. So you're either going to say it's it, you go out of existence and then now you're uh, um, not a person or you're something else. And then at the resurrection, mm -hmm. you become a person again, but then what, what was that in the intermediate state? So if you have a soul existing that's not functioning, well, if I'm not reducible to mere functioning, and if on my view, functioning is grounded in my essence, i.e. my soul, well, then you, you're holding to my view, you're just, the only caveat is that it doesn't function too well. And, and even if you want to go that route, I'd, be, I'd say that's fine, but now you're, now you're in my camp. Welcome to the team. So I would still say that the, to the, team. Right, the, the person is, a, is the body and soul. It's just that the body is dissolved into its parts. It's like, it's, it's, they're still, the, the person, the existence of them still is, is there. It's just that the, the body is no longer there to represent, I guess, within physical reality. Well, certainly not animated, that's for sure. And I would then say like the soul doesn't, isn't animate either without the body. It's, it, I'm, I'm waiting for the, the physicalism accusation from somebody. Like I figured that that would be, I'd be on the way. Uh, but I actually think that the, the value in this is that it becomes really palatable um, to non-Christians. The idea that, that the, 
the soul doesn't do anything without the body. Uh, the idea that that death really is is a is a huge deal, um, and we can't make light of it, um, ends up being great for evangelism. How would that be different for Eric, though? So um, specifically, and I'll, I'll go ahead and let Eric um, speak after this. Uh, I think that Eric has an obstacle he has to overcome in evangelizing in evangelizing uh, because he thinks that they need to accept some st- substance dualism first. Wait, what? But no, you don't. Do substance you? dualism would be logically prior. Like you, you couldn't uh, believe in the um, the correct Christian faith without also holding to substance dualism. Is that right, yeah, Eric? So, uh, no. Uh, um, and, and let me say too, hopefully that didn't sound uh, uh, bad when Sarah went, ooh, when I, when I said what I said, I felt like, oh, maybe that came no, out wrong. No, I love a good sparring match. Like yeah, that's the, a good, it's ooh. A good yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so a few, a few <laughs> things, um, if you have the soul existing, well, uh, two questions, one, well, let me ask a question, then let me answer, uh, what, what Sarah asked, um, then what would the soul be? What are you in that intermediate state? If you have a functionless soul, what is it if it's not a human person? What, is it even a person? And then it sounds like special pleading if you're going to say God and angels and demons exist in our persons yet don't have bodies. Uh, now, regarding substance dualism, I think here a distinction needs to be made uh, because when I evangelize, I don't say, you know, hey, Christ died for your sins. Uh, and if you accept them, you know, you'll have, have eternal life. But also you have to believe in substance dualism. <laughs> There's a difference between what has to be the case ontologically with what exists with reality versus epistemically what people believe. I think we're all going into the afterlife with some false beliefs. So thankfully, getting into heaven is not uh, uh, predicated on passing a theological philosophical exam. So I someone can hold to a false belief uh, uh, regarding uh, the soul or, or the nature of human persons, but that has nothing in, to say as to whether or not ontologically speaking, substance dualism is true. So I have friends that I think are saved that are not substance dualists, but again, epistemically, it's not needed for salvation, but ontologically, I would say it is. I could be wrong, but I think it is, but that's different from what the person believes. Epistemically, so you're they can saying hold to different you, you believe this to be true, and so it's necessary for someone to be a Christian, but it's not that you are getting them to agree to this. It's just that it's part of what you know to be true to begin with, right? Well, well I, I, maybe maybe a parallel, and if I, if I can come up with one would be, let's say I meet someone who doesn't believe they exist, right? <laughs> now, yeah. uh, uh, can, can this person be saved? Yes, they can, but they don't believe they exist. Now, ontologically speaking, in order to be saved, you have to exist. But epistemically speaking, you don't have to believe you exist in order so perhaps you to be saved. It, I know it's, it would be a weird situation, but nevertheless, my point is they can have epistemically, they can have false beliefs, even though ontologically what's there, what's needed is already there for them to achieve or, or receive the, the free gift of salvation, even if epistemically okay. they don't believe they exist. I, I Does that think make I sense? Yeah. So I am super glad that we both agree that there's no quiz to get into heaven. Uh, we yes. don't need a philosophy test in order to get there. Um, the uh, I actually think that that's that's another like one of my passions is I think that a lot of people do that um, and they don't realize it they really the, the, a lot of people think there's a test and if you don't know all the right things then you don't make it yeah um, but um, actually I wonder if the the substance dualism ends up opening the door that direction anyway um, so if the the uh, I am a soul um, uh, and uh, the body ends up being ontologically secondary. Um, because it doesn't have the ontological priority, uh, does value flow that way also? Say more um, words. So, what do you, wait, wait, what do you mean? So uh, if, if- For the people in the back. What so it, if, if the soul is the foundation of the body, um, does the value of the soul then also create the value of the body? And therefore we have to value the soul and immaterial things first. Why does that matter? Uh, I, well, I think it would matter uh, for the difference of education versus like feeding someone. Because if the mind matters first, then we should educate them before we feed them. Um, I'm going to let Eric take that because I don't know that I quite understand. Obviously, so, so I, I think each a baby something before right. you give them food. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, so I mean, a few things to say here, and, and I think 
I don't even think I have to say that much, but basically it seems like you're saying if if the value is grounded in the soul, then we should attend to spiritual matters prior to physical matters. And I think, no, I don't think that's the case, nor do I think the Bible teaches that. I don't, uh, before I feed someone or give someone a drink of a cup of water, I don't ask them if they're saved or ask them if they know the Lord. I don't, I don't have to know their spiritual status before I, you know, give them a ride or something like that or, or give them food. Um, so again, there's a difference, I think, a distinction that's really important here is what is it that grounds something versus maybe pragmatically speaking, what's what do I need to attend to first? Because it would make no sense to preach to someone while they're starving and not give them a sandwich and yet say, you know, but, you know, you know, turn or burn kind of thing. Right. Uh, so then the only thing that I, I would then ask is if um, why wouldn't the, the, the our ontology here, our metaphysics here, our discussion of the soul then line up with our values? So I would think that uh, when I talk about something uh, like abortion, and I think that life begins at conception, and there's a soul at, immediately at conception, it, that goes perfectly with hylomorphic metaphysics, because there's matter and form instantly at conception, where 23 chromosomes on one side and 23 chromosomes on the other unite. Um, the um, Likewise with something like um, uh, knowledge or caring for the body, things like that, I, I get to argue uh, that my metaphysics lines up with the Christian values that I think are, are taught in, the, in scripture. I guess I don't hear Eric not saying that. Am I hearing yeah. something wrong? Yeah, I would say what I'm sort of hearing is that Evan is accusing Eric <laughs> of, of prioritizing the soul at the expense of the body, while Evan is wanting to say that they're both on equal footing. They're both of equal importance. But Eric is not actually saying that <laughs> the soul is more important right presently <laughs> uh, i'm asking if the the why would he open the door that direction even if he's not choosing to go okay. through it uh well i I'm, i don't know what you'd mean by open the door but you know if something's true then you know whether people like it or not would be irrelevant but but i don't see how saying that the soul is ontologically prior to the body opens the door to anything other than the fact that it's just ontologically prior to the body it's like saying my mind is prior to my thoughts without my mind there are no thoughts that isn't somehow give some type of uh, importance or, or, or credence to one another. When we're talking ontology, we're not necessarily talking hmm. uh, in terms of moral value or, or, or anything like that. It's just ontology. It's it's what comes, what what's needed to ground the other thing. And that, that would, I mean, anything else you say after that would be a, an addition to that, which people could hold various views, but that in and of itself, that the soul is prior to the body and what, what drives the body, doesn't have the implications that I think you're, you're saying. Okay, so if, again, average Joe is listening to this, I could imagine them saying, it sounds like they're not that far apart, these guys, right? I mean, Evan talked at the beginning about, you know, there are these rivers that if you follow them to the logical conclusion, they're miles apart or whatever. But maybe we can tackle a different topic where it'll be more clear how they differ. I mean, you have a couple of ways that you think that there's some practical applications to y'all's differing perspectives can we maybe move to one of those because as you guys are talking right now i don't think most people will hear much of a difference gotcha um so i actually i think that the evangelism point and, as and the abortion point end up being big ones uh i think that it, it actually makes it easier to talk about these things when we have form um causally connected in this way uh we could talk about free will a little bit in this way at the same time um and then, but I, I think the other big one would be transgenderism. Um, transgenderism actually needs substance dualism because they need the mind and the body to be separate. Um, they have to have a, a male mind and a female body or a, f uh, a female mind and a male body. Uh, is that the one I just said? <laughs> but, it, it doesn't matter, but you're uh, saying mind. You, you, Do you mean soul? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I think okay. that Eric would, would have those as the, as the same definitions, if I n remember correctly. Is mind and soul the same? Uh, no, not not on my view, and and uh, and I think you you may be perhaps unintentionally mischaracterizing my view. You're you're thinking more of a Cartesian dualism where the mind just is the substance. Where on my view, the the, the focus is more on the soul, and the mind is a capacity or a faculty of the soul. Um, so I have um, well, I won't go that deep, but okay. but um, yeah, I, I don't. I, I mean, I. Some of the some of the accusations you're giving could apply to some versions of substance dualism, but I just don't see how they would apply to mine. And you would have to unpack how specifically they would have they would apply to my version of it. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that the organicism in particular um, helps head all of these off. But I, now we're back to the same point of 
How do we know that the organicism is true? Um, why don't they, they causally link together? Um, let's dive into to free will then in particular. Well, wait, so, yeah. Okay, never <laughs> mind. Hold on. Yeah, yeah I, no, I, I don't okay. want to leave the, the transgender thing because it's so relevant. Okay. And, 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 and basically, it's symptomatic, I think, of the way the modern person, um, they understand themselves as fundamentally different from their body. I mean, I remember years ago, I think even Oprah, like was, it was one of those things that people kind of captured from Oprah saying that basically we are souls in bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a, a very common belief. Um, and, and, I, and I think if, if you really believed that to the full extent, which I think is what Evan is saying Eric believes, but I yes. think Eric is denying that, <laughs> um, that we are only souls in bodies, that our bodies are just bags of vessels. Of, yeah, of, yeah we're, they're just mere vessels. They, they're basically meaningless vessels. All the meaning is in the soul. Then we can see how that would be a problem because then someone who really believes that they are a woman in a man's body, instead of trying to have their mind changed, they change their body because what's the body? It's just, it's just a bag of, hmm. you know, it's just what it, James White always quotes this from Star Trek, which is an <laughs> ugly bag of mostly water. Okay. Um, so I don't know what Leighton Flowers uh, quotation is from Star Trek on that. So to, just to keep the <laughs> rivalry going. Okay. Sorry about that. No, but anyway, so for ugly bags and mostly water, then sure, let's, let's, I'll just say it, let's mutilate the body to be in con conformity with the soul. If the soul gets priority, um, now, both of y'all reject transgenderism. Do you reject it for the same reason? Do you reject mm -hmm. it for different reasons? Um, Eric, I mean, Evan kind of brought this up towards you. So, I mean, come back on that. I mean, I mean, are, uh, let, me, let me ask this. Are there substance dualists or is substance dualism as the philosophical underpinning of like what your average person says? Like, mm -hmm. are those two things even connected or... You know what I'm saying? Like the Oprah thing of like, we are souls in bodies. Is that a bastardized form of substance dualism? Um, not necessarily. It is a version of it. And, and I think uh, just at its bare mere substance dualism, it's simply the fact that there is a soul, something immaterial, and there's something physical, which Evan holds to. So that's why I say even technically he's a, a version of substance dualism. Um, mm -hmm. Some argue that Descartes had this uh, uh, kind of what you're describing where there's not really any internal relations. On my view, almost everything's internally related between body and soul, but Descartes was more like a like an external relation, almost like God kind of had to tie them or sew them together, so to speak, where there could be instances, of, let's say like a Freaky Friday where you switch bodies. <laughs> uh, on, on my view, um, first, so I, I would argue, and I would have to unpack it, and I would, I would, it, and I'm not going to, but I would argue that the soul is gendered, so that the soul is male or female, uh, uh, given uh, the the traducing view and organicism view of the soul that I hold to, um, and I even uh, passed this along to Moreland. He, he said he agreed, so it's always great to when one of your heroes say, "Yeah, you're you're on the right track there." Um, so I, I think the souls are gendered. So wouldn't it be possible for for uh, uh, that type of a, a transgender reality to, to take place. Now you can chop off parts and remove parts and replace parts, but but if you are not if you are not reducible to your body, then that doesn't make you what you are. What makes you what you are is your essence, your nature, which I would argue would be grounded in your soul. So going back to the Traducian organicism view, the soul is an external expression or realization of what the soul is. Like I said, if I put a blanket over a chair, um, just because I break the chair up, so to speak, and, and you know, all analogies are going to break down at some point, but you know, I'm not <laughs> like going to change chair. it being a chair, right? Yeah, like the chair. So, so my body is a reflection of what I am. It, it's an uh, it's an a posteriori way of investigating and seeing the things that my like. I have to plug it in a second. I know now you um, look like you're on some episode of 2020. Like we've had to hide his <laughs> his identity. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. He doesn't want to yeah, because, admit to substance because he's a heretic. Um, so. <laughs> So, so yeah, so on, on my view that I hold of substance dualism, that, that's just not, not possible. I think and, that's and, a nice, fascinating thing that the soul is gendered. I remember somebody asking me this question a while, and we've lost him. He's been taken up to the he's Lord. He's just fixing so the light. No, I know. Uh, you'll feel free to weigh in, but asked if souls have genders. And I'm realizing now that they, they have to. 
Both of y'all would say that, wouldn't you? No. Oh, so snap. Here we go. I would say that, that in fact, if the souls are gender are, are gendered, then the form has form, which is redundant. I thought the form was the body. The form, the form is the soul. So the, oh ma boy. the matter is the body. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, um, I would think that we're actually making the soul into a body. Wait, let me go back like to the this. metaphor for the dummies in the room. The, the you statue. A, no, the, you put a blanket over something. Isn't the blanket like the body? You can see what's underneath by the form of the blanket. Plato and Aristotle are both rolling over in their graves. Yes. Where only their immaterial. <laughs> okay, let me stop. So, so form is not the body. Correct. Form is not the body. Okay. The body well. is formed. Okay. And so the, the body needs some sort of some sort of shape or some sort of organization that ends up causing it to exist in the specific way it does. Because what the body is is hydrogen and carbon and yeah. a little bit of phosphorus and other, other like stuff. random things, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So the it needs to be organized in a particular way. And that organization is the soul. So, Which so you don't think is gendered. In, okay. In one sentence, then why is transgenderism? Uh, would you say is it a wrong belief? If so, why? Uh, I would, yes, it's wrong because the person is uh, because the person is their body, and I can be confident enough to say that. Here's the accusations of physicalism. Where it's ready, I'm I, mm. I'm so ready. So uh, the person is just also their soul, and to say that they're they're only one or the other is the false point. Um, so to to try to say that a person is only a soul or is only a body is both wrong in the same way that we would say a statue is only marble or is only in the shape of mm. Martin Luther King Jr. They would both be wrong positions. Hmm. I have to noodle on that a little bit. <laughs> so, so, so here's where I would I would argue and, and say well, maybe if I can start throwing some accusations uh, be because there are a few things I think that you you haven't answered because one I think it's special pleading to say that that uh, a form needs matter but then you have God and like I said angels are persons without matter. Um, this you would also I'm I'm assuming based on what you said you discount any possibility of an NDE, you know, a disembodied experience. That's near experience. death experiences. Yes. And, and, and then talking your lingo, man. Also have, you know, have an answer than what is a person in an intermediate state. But um, I, mean, I don't know if you want to j j jump to there, but it seems that on your view then, so if you're going to say that the person is the body, when you use that word is, because there's four different variations of the word is as you i'm sure you're familiar with in philosophy this is what happens a when you have bit, two yeah. philosophers on right. the show what is is or okay, bill clinton, or bill clinton. Oh, okay yeah. <laughs> oh, so it, it so i i don't think you're saying it's an is of identity maybe an is a constitution but but here's a problem so jaguan kim who's an atheist philosopher the late jaguan kim gave this really interesting argument for uh identity through change and grounding identity through change he says basically he says this brain and body did not exist in 2011 but I did exist in 2011, there, and then therefore I am not my irreducible identical to my brain and body. Now he didn't even hold to that argument necessarily, but you know he kind of you know threw it out there. I think it's a great argument though. Um, so if you're going to say I am my body, then what happens when there's part replacement and change? What is it that grounds my identity to change? Hmm. So I would say that the soul, like the soul, still grounds your identity and change. And so we we agree on that. Um, I wouldn't think that consciousness is possible without a soul either. And the soul ends up being um, the grounding for a lot of this. Uh, but with, if I am the soul, then I need a way for my soul to change also, because I like am still also changing. Hmm. Um, uh, and How I do angels do, do it? that through the body. So something like habits, like what, would I, what do I do with my habits? Like, are those part of me or just part of my body? Yeah, so, well, they're part of your body, uh, and I think that goes into Romans 7, but I'm curious, and how do angels do it? How do angels uh, entertain different thoughts without so bodies? So, we're going to get we're gonna get real complicated. Uh, oh, so, we're not already? Cool, cool, so cool, cool. So, we, we, <laughs> we can have pure forms, but they would literally be the, the uh, impossible to instantiate materially, and um, they would be the sole exister of their species, because they would be the entire representative of their species. Um, so Aquinas covers this in Summa Contra Gentilis. Uh, oh, for yes. anyone who wants to be super nerdy and read uh, 80 pages of Latin, um, it's his only way to try to reconcile Aristotle and the existence of angels and demons. And it does, he does it beautifully. Um, it gets really complicated, uh, but it would be like the, the um, uh, like if we take bears, like the, there's multiple different types of bears that can exist and they have their own particular way of existing 
I leave it open to God that there are things that cannot be particular, that they are, they can only exist in general. Um, and that would be angels and demons. So that gets really, really complicated real fast. And then God himself, like I would also go into things like essence and existence, um, but God's essence is existence. And so I don't need a material cause for God or an agent cause for God hmm. for things like that. But everything else, they still, they have material causes and agent causes and things like that. I just don't think that human beings um, can exist with a formal cause alone, but that we clearly have material causes and then further, because I want to get back to the theological points, mm -hmm. uh, I would think that this is necessarily demonstrated in scripture because of the incarnation. Um, Jesus could not have simply incarnated as a soul and saved humanity. In fact, like- But you wouldn't say that either, right, Eric? Yeah. They, we right. Have, I mean, it's, it's an oxymoron to say incarnated soul. Yeah, incarnated right. means, yeah. So the I would think that the fact that Jesus had like took a body um, ends up- being a, a huge testament to the idea that human being or the, I mean, the fact we call them human beings, like the persons are biological, like we need a body. Um, and that saying that we're, we are not bodies, um, but we are souls kind of like reduces even the, the incarnation to something that I wouldn't want to do either. Did Jesus function uh, pretty good uh, after he <laughs> died within those three days? Uh, oh. Uh, according to First Peter three verse eighteen, uh, he descended into Hades. So um, that wasn't my question. I would think no. I would think he didn't function. I would think he didn't do anything. Uh, he died on. And Friday. you call me the heretic, right? <laughs> he died on Friday, which no is the, one's calling which anyone. Which is the sixth heretic. day of of Jewish calendar, and then the seventh day he rested, and then he rose again on the on the eighth day. So, so I'll, I'll leave that there because I think it speaks for itself and I don't think there's need to push back there. But, but it seems like on your view, it's not – this body that I have right now is not necessarily what I need to be me. I just need somebody. And, and if you say yes to that, then I think it's actually on your view that it's more plausible metaphysically to have this transgender possibility. Hmm. What say you, Evan? That the I just need some sort of body. I would think that the, the soul – um, is um, displayed through the body. So like somebody that's blind, um, if you look at their, their neurochemistry, like that oftentimes that the brain is actually ready to receive data for sight. There's just something else in the way. Um, maybe they're like they're, your literal eyes get damaged. Like your brain is still able to, mm -hmm. to receive the data. It's just, it doesn't have the, the organ there necessary to mm -hmm. do so. Uh, I would think that the um, the connection between the two ends up moving that direction where um, it's the, the soul is already set and it's not like we can um, take somebody and make them functionally female when they're already hardwired with the um, testosterone that they've been been born with. Uh, Let me, if, if people's heads have not already exploded, there are two things I want to get back to just before we went out of time that I'm curious about one person. This is something we talked about with Eric, but people are asking because it's just one of those questions people ask when we talk about the soul, which is about animals. So I want to ask that sort of quick question of both of you, but then you said earlier that there was a um, kind of ramification of this for free will. And I know you promised your wife, you wouldn't talk about it too much. So we saved it to the end, yeah. but I'm curious about that because I'd be curious how you and Eric might differ in your views of free will and how that has to do with your view of the soul. So yeah. maybe say something about that. So I, I don't have a problem with saying that the, the soul is necessary for free will. Um, Eric and I are going to differ by what we mean by free will, though, in the in doing this. Um, so uh, for me, I think my philosophical advantage, my logical advantage is that I see causal relation between body and soul. But actually, one of uh, the popular substance dualist argument is to say that the brain brain states only correlate to thought and that the soul is actually causing it. Um, it's a common argument for that co uh, correlation is not causation mm -hmm. to try to argue that we might be able to to watch things happen in the body, but to think that that causes it is a different thing. Can um, you put that into an example? Like Susie's going out with like, give me something a six-year-old can understand here. Oh, just so. Or 16 uh, or. Correlation is not causation is, is awesome. Like if you just Google that. No, no, like, that I get. Okay. But explain how your view of the soul helps the so, free will. Yeah. So my, the, the will of the soul can interact with the body in this way. But if the, if the body and soul are more distinct, if there's no causal relation where the, the body's brain states don't influence the soul, 
Mm -hmm. um, then um, it's hard to argue that free will like can make the body do things. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So like, how how is free will supposed to impact the body if it's immaterial only? And so what we need is for everything to be integrated into a more like unified single system. Hmm. Um, ultimately, I would think that that we need to put freedom on a scale and to say that I am more or less free to do things depending on other things. So like if I were to ask Eric, like what does he want or does he prefer um, oatmeal or cereal for breakfast? And he answers oatmeal, which is wrong, by the way. Then, <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> uh, then I, I could ask him like, why didn't you choose pancakes? And the answer would clearly be like, I didn't know that was an option because pancakes are also clearly better and the French toast better <laughs> than that. Um, and the, the limiting factor here is knowledge. Like it, that knowledge ends up made him less free because he didn't know those were options. Okay, but wait, before we get into a whole thing about free will and, and options and choices, what do you think, Eric, about this idea about causation and and the soul as it regards free will? Yeah, so, uh, um, and don't get mad at me for doing this, but I, I do want to touch on something he did say before we got into this and, and just- Go for it. That, so on my view, your function is grounded in your nature, your soul, as I've, I've said numerous times. So- he, he seems to be so I would agree that while I'm bodied, I need eyes to see. But the only reason I can see and that I have eyes in the first place is because my soul has the capacity for sight. So if you remove my eyes, you're removing the while embodied the mechanism through which my soul actualizes its capacity for sight. But if you could hypothetically put in a different set of eyeballs that worked, I would see again because it has always been the case that the function is grounded in the soul and not necessarily the body. If anything, the body has what it has and the parts that it has because of the kind of soul that it is. So I just want to clarify that. Now, regard to causation, so I don't know of any substance dualism that that uses the kind of argument that would say correlation is not causation. Uh, I, I do think correlation at times is causation. What I've said, I can't speak for every other substance dualist, but correlation doesn't entail identity. Uh, uh, just because a uh, there are C fibers firing in my brain when I feel pain doesn't mean that pain is C fibers firing. And I know you would agree with that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, that there is a two-way causation between the, the the soul and the body or the mind and brain however you want to put it um yeah if you if you were to put electrodes on my brain and you could you know shock certain regions of my brain you couldn't you could make me smell my grandmother's cooking um but we what we also know from neuroplasticity and cognitive behavioral therapy is that i as a, a you would have to be an immaterial self <clears throat> and i would even say the soul has to be a simple thing that it is because uh that you you are not reducible to your brain and body that you can think thoughts that your brain would impose on you like you see with ocd and anxiety jeffrey mm -hmm. swartz who's one of the leading researchers in this area has written a book called you are not your brain has a four-step process that basically prescribes to his patients uh, uh teaches them how to go against the habitual thoughts that your brain imposes on you when you have a thought you dig a groove the more you keep having that thought or or, or behavior that's what creates a habit and there's a deeply dug groove in the brain and in order to in a literal sense rewire the brain you have to think differently um that i, I can expand there but but i mean i i guess that, that would be sufficient just for, for discussion for now so yeah uh, um oh and, and the the free will thing yeah so we do we do have different views of free will because so so i don't think free will is degreed in the sense that free will is something that you either have or you don't have now, when you talk about options, you're no longer talking about free will, you're talking about availability of options. And I think sometimes people often confuse those two. They're not the same thing. If, if I have a, if I look into my closet and I have 10 shirts to wear and I look in your closet, you have 20, you don't have more free will than I do. We still, mm. we, we still have the same amount of free will. You just have more options to choose from. That has nothing to do with whether or not my will is free or not. Hmm. So that I'd be confused. What is your definition of free will? That you are the originator and source of your will and or actions. You're the uh, first that, mover. So will. I would agree that we are the originator and source of our will, but that doesn't didn't say anything about freedom. So I actually start agreeing with John Locke a little bit and saying that freedom and will are just two totally different things. Uh, we, well, we try to link them and it's awkward. Um, and to say that my, my freedom it applies to the will in different ways. Are y'all talking about freedom? Freedom. Oh boy, Sorry. stop, just stop. 
Sorry, Eric. Oh my gosh. No, no. <laughs> so, so the the will is is a volition. The the it is a mental state of bringing about. So if I bring about the lifting of my arm and I was the source of that, then I had the free will to do it. But if you shot me with a taser and it caused me to lift my arm, then I was not the source of that movement. So I did not uh, bring about, there was no volition or will to do that. It, instead, it was caused by something external to me and beyond my control. So for free will, if you're not the source, you don't have libertarian free will, I would argue. Okay, so, so when you're, you're shocked, do you have the ability to do otherwise? To other, like uh, you're shocked in your arm. Do you have the ability to do otherwise? Well, what it's often gonna, it's the gonna, definition of free will, which is where I thought you were gonna go. Yeah, no. So I don't, I don't hold to that as a necessary condition for free will. I think it's a okay. sufficient condition, but not necessary. Um, and then when you ask, do I have the ability? When I hear that, I think, do I have the capacity? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do. Although I'm not utilizing it because perhaps I was caught off guard or whatever. But I would say yes, I still have the capacity to do so, even if I didn't. And I think one important thing we haven't really discussed, and maybe you guys are just ahead of me and I'm catching up, but is the soul slash body, uh, when it is a slave to sin before Christ comes along and, and we have the spirit in us, how is that different from once the spirit is living in us and we are no longer slaves to sin, right? But slaves to Christ. Does that change kind of what we're talking about? And do y'all's different opinions or, or uh perspectives on the soul feed into that. Do you understand um, the question? Yeah, I would think that my view would necessitate a, a resurrection. Like that would be logically necessary because that's otherwise we can't, like our, our existence is suspended. Um, it's a- uh, Wait, a resurrection, what do you mean? So one day I am um, not on team Jesus. The next day I'm like, I've seen the light. Oh, you I mean want like, Jesus so to come for, into my heart. For regeneration or conversion. Yes, okay. justification. So, yeah. um, uh, I would think that the that something like original sin um, would or the would already spell like we're, that we're going to die, and then even with something like a like a resurrection or like with a, a regeneration, um, like we still die. That's still a thing. It's it, we would need a, a renewal. We would need new life, and that seems to happen for both body and soul in one single event. I guess what I'm asking is if the soul <clears throat> is affected by by uh, becoming a Christian, then do y'all different perspectives on the soul and the body change? Uh, maybe I'm not saying it's very, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Um, I, I think I get you. Yeah, I think so. Do you want to react to what yeah, I'm, go, you think I'm trying it, to say? Eric, Cause there's something there. Yeah, so, um, and, and so with regards to free will, you know, it says we're a slave to sin. So when we get saved, what metaphysically is there some change that happens that, Maybe it would allow us to be quote more free or no longer slaves of sin. Right. Um, so so I so uh, when you look at Romans seven, you have Paul talking about you know, what what I want to do, I don't do. Yeah. What I don't want to do, I end up doing. And then he says, uh, you know, I've learned that there's nothing good within me, and he specifies that is within my flesh. And then he talks about this battle between the spirit and and the flesh, and I think that goes into spiritual formation. I think when you come into a relationship with God. Uh, um, the, uh, around this time, they would have understood human flourishing as, uh, um, with regards to morally speaking, how are they designed? For me, morality is very heavily teleological, which means it has a goal or purpose. I was intended for a certain thing and to be a certain way and to live a certain way. And when I align myself with that design plan, I am able to flourish more as a human being. Salvation is definitely, I would, uh, I would argue, is something that we're all created for, to be in fellowship with God. And when we enter into relationship with God, then we begin to develop the capacities that we already have. There are higher order capacities. I'll say this, and I'll, I'll let Evan uh, say something. Uh, first order capacity to speak English, but I don't have the first order capacity to speak French, but I do have the second order capacity to develop the capacity to speak French. So it's already grounded within me, my soul, not my body. My body is an expression of my soul. Um, so it is because of these capacities that when I come into fellowship with God, I am able to develop more and align myself in the way in which I was created. So um, we, this is discipleship, this is spiritual formation, even things like fasting and, 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 and all, all the spiritual disciplines helps you actualize the capacities that you were already created with that God intended you to use. And gotcha. would you agree with that? Uh, yes, actually. I, I, um, so I would think that the, um, that the effect on our, um, on, our, on our souls at the moment of conversion, at the moment of regeneration, 
um, bleeds into our body that way too, though. Um, so things like habits is actually where I put moral value. Um, somebody with good habits doesn't have to struggle to do what's right. And I find that to be the, uh, the high point uh, because as, as being human that translates to, or being the best human, being good at being human would translate into things of our bodies to moral excellencies would then be part of our bodies as well. Okay. And Eric, that, that would make sense as well for you? Absolutely. In fact, a, a Sermon on the Mount, um, you know, you, you, you see kind of Christ being sarcastic when he says, you know, you've heard it said, you know, don't murder, you know, okay, you haven't murdered, pat yourself on the back, but who here has hated their brother? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, same thing with adultery. Okay, you haven't committed adultery, pat yourself on the back, but who here lusts after a woman? What he's getting at is it's not just the behavior I'm trying to get you to change, but it's your very way of thinking about these mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. it's not just behavior modeling modification, but it's literally a spiritual formation and a renewing of the mind that when you change the way you look at these things, which is going to take uh, disciplines of, of aligning yourself in the way you were created, then like you said beautifully, it's not going to be a struggle to, to do what's right when your very mentality on what you're supposed to do has already been changed. That's why you get something radical like Jesus, who is being spit on and crucified and mocked on the cross, and the only thing that he can think of is to say, Father, forgive him, for they don't know what they do. That's a guy who has really spent some time uh, uh, becoming the type of human being, being that we are supposed to become. But you look at his life, it was filled with spiritual disciplines, uh, uh, separating himself, being in tune with God, fasting, and so forth. Mm -hmm. oh, we're over an hour, so I, I we probably need to wrap it up soon. But I wanted to ask, I wanted to get back to NDEs just as a way to maybe wrap things up. Would that be okay? Sure. Unless you had another question? No, we, y'all can get on Facebook and tell this one person what you think about animals and souls. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's well, fine. No. I disagree with both of them. No, so actually, I, I like the NDE discussion because it's another one. NDE, like. near okay. death experience. So, Do it. Well, and actually, you know, Gary Habermas makes like such a big deal of NDEs, like as part of his argument kind of for resurrection, ultimately. I mean, it's part of his resurrect defense of the resurrection, the idea that, you know, that there, that, that if we can sort of, I don't really like using it to be honest as an, an mm -hmm. argument for the resurrection because it's like, well, if we can prove this step, then that, then this is possible. And then we can prove that step. I don't like that. But, um, but I understand what he's, Kind of saying and basically the argument is that we have all of this these these evidences like all these cases of people who like floated above the operating table like floated into the operating room next door new details about operations going on or they saw they witnessed a crime like three blocks over like at the time that they were dying and all this sort of thing and these are credible and they're like skeptical and they're critical you know cases of, of ndes so my question is it's kind of a yes or no evan are near-death experiences possible on your view or or is there or or must we come up with some other way to explain those accounts that seem very credible uh, you didn't even need to say uh or uh, okay. no i don't think they're they're even <laughs> possible okay. um so my go-to example is anesthesia uh, so when you're put under for surgery um the uh you breathe in the gas and then uh four hours later it feels like five seconds and you're waking up in a different mm -hmm. room uh, which would mean that either the uh, anesthetic gas is affecting your soul um, or your soul doesn't even have the ability to perceive time without the body. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the soul sees without the body. I think your eyes do that. I don't think the soul hears. I think your, your ears do that. Uh, I think that the, the body is even necessary to perceive the passage of time. Um, and so it ends up being that near-death experiences are entirely impossible. I would think that visions are possible, but those aren't the same thing and people don't treat them like the same thing. The, right, that's a its own supernatural yeah, event. The the near death experiences are are going to be um, categorically ruled out. Eric, I mean, I assume you affirm the po possibility of NDEs. Yeah, the possibility and the actuality of it. Uh, I think a lot of what Evan said. I I just and I don't. With all due respect, I, I don't know if he's read much <laughs> up on the subject. Uh, there's a book I'm currently reading uh, called "The Science of Near Death Experiences," uh, written by not some you know. Uh, mom and pop, you know, religious bookstore, but by a, a university that published it. Uh, um, and most, if not all of the cases are written by physicians uh, who have their documentation for it. Um, when he says they're impossible, I, 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 I'm curious, especially him being a philosopher, what he means by that, because I, it, modally speaking, it's not logically impossible to, I mean, there's a simple argument for the uh, soul that I am possibly disembodiable, but my body is not disembodiable, therefore I am not my body. I mean, that's just a simple modal distinction. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 3. Paul says, and I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. 
Here, Paul is saying at least it is possible. So he disagrees with Evan. Um, so you pick who you want to side with, Paul or Evan. And oh, he says mercy. it's at least possible, it seems, to, to be disembodied. If you need eyes to see and, and, and ears to hear something physical, then how did, you know, the, the witch of, uh, where is that lady from? Witch of uh, Endor. Uh, Endor, you know, then you have Samuel, you know, where he's dead, yet he's seen, he's talking, whatnot. And again, I'm going to go back to a special plane where you refer to God. Uh, well, God and angels can do this, but we we need uh, something physical. And then lastly, NDE's, uh, a really good book uh, is called, uh, um, I think it's Imagine Heaven by John Burke. <clears throat> and what you see is you have cases of children. You have cases of blind people, people who are born blind, uh, temporarily receiving sight in, in NDEs, people knowing stuff they could not have known. Um, and what's interesting is that when you look across the board at the verified, you know, people don't just take any story of an NDE and put it into a book. There has to be a certain criteria that needs to be met. Uh, Flatline, no, no heartbeat for a certain amount of time. So there's no person had, hasn't had oxygen. There's no brain activity. After a certain amount of time, we know the person's gone. And you have instances where, for example, one person uh, died <clears throat> and wherever he went to saw his grandfather. And he's like, hey, what are you doing here? He's like. Uh, I need you to tell the family I just passed away. He comes back, and as soon as they resuscitate him, he starts freaking out, saying, call my grandfather, call my grandfather. He just passed away. I just saw him. They think, man, yeah, he must have been hallucinating. But he was so uh, ecstatic about it they, that the nurses said, can somebody get a hold of the grandfather to let him know that, you know, to just calm him down? Turns out, sure enough, at that time, grandfather passed away in the way that was described. Um, issues of children who... I think it was like at a Thanksgiving dinner and they're not all happy go lucky NDEs. One little girl went up to the parents. I think it was like during uh, Thanksgiving or something and says, Hey, uh, you never told me I had a daughter. Parents are like, what are you talking about? Do you mean your cousin? No, not my cousin. I have a, excuse me, a sister. And, and the mom's like, well, what was the, what was her name? And she's like, well, she said you never gave her a name. And the dad's really confused. The, the, the wife turns like pale and says, well, well, yeah, well, how, how do you know? He's like, well, I, I met her when I went to heaven and she said that you sucked her out of your tummy. <gasps> because of that, there was a big embarrassment brought upon the family and the, the, the couple ended up getting a divorce. Not a happy-go-lucky story. Mm -hmm. the, the woman didn't, much less, not only did she not tell her husband, I don't know who she told, but I mean, there, there's lots of interesting cases like this. Again, the, the case with blind people, a case of a woman who had a procedure, her name's Pam, maybe Reynolds, I forget her last name. Really interesting procedure that only like has been done a handful of times in the world. And she had an NDE, was able to tell the doctor what happened and the way in which she articulated it. I don't know if it's from this case or another, but the doctor pretty much said, I could have used this person's testimony of their NDE to teach a class on how to perform Whoa. this procedure because it was so accurate. Wow. The person had no medical knowledge of anything uh, of these Crazy. kind of procedures. These are the reasons why I'm skeptical of NDEs. I, I don't believe a single one of the stories you've told. Uh, I think and, that and they're, you don't have they're to, logically so impossible. I think it's superstitious. I think what do you mean by logically hard impossible? To, to evangelize. Uh, I mean, like you, like the 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 soul doesn't have eyeballs, and instead we're making the soul into a body in order to kind of make these things work. Hmm. Under the assumption that you need something physical to see, though. So you're Under the begging the question. That, that my body has certain functions, and uh, I think that anesthesia is a is a clear counterexample that our soul doesn't okay, have so these functions. Okay, so let me – Eric has mentioned this several times. Can angels see? Um, uh, using the, our definition of the word see, no. Sight is, is something that you need eyeballs for. So they're sort of supernaturally guided – yeah, there's there's another four, and so and again. What about, what about the six winged seraph that covers its so eyes? So many that, eyes. That is All a, the that eyes. That is a vision. Okay. <laughs> and so I I'm okay with visions. Visions are fine. Yeah. Visions are listed in scripture. Yeah. Um, there are times where it looks like something supernatural has happened, and then there's a second account given in a different gospel, and it literally says vision, hmm. um, and makes makes me happy when I discover these. So things. what about okay, um, to, to, <laughs> um, um, Eric? I'm going to use your argument again. What about God? Can God see? Uh, God now has eyeballs because he took a took a body. But oh boy! The standard but word said, sight, like it, I'm gonna get out of the way. This, certain... this is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. God, God doesn't have a body. <laughs> okay. okay, I mean, so you'd say pre-incarnation. Yeah, there's then sight would not be a thing because he needs a body. And, oh, Marcy and Eric, you're, well, you, you, I'm you, saying that you're just gonna you're just gonna let that mic drop right there. Yeah, I'm guessing. Do you and I? Did we say <laughs> whose side we're taking okay. on this? Or no. but but notice that that his response to my NDEs that I briefly mentioned was simply I don't believe it. 
Okay, yeah, well, so like with, with abortion, 25% of word, women in get. America get abortions. Like the, the girl had a 25% shot. Like you don't think that one little girl has correctly guessed it without a near-death experience? Hmm. Well, it's not It's not just about guessing. It goes into a specific instance, the specific case. And that's just one out of a myriad of examples. You still have to deal with the, the, the people who are blind, people who knew stuff they could not have known. And, and you talked about anesthesia. There's no anesthesia given to someone who has no blood in their body, brain dead, and no <laughs> oxygen, and their heart's not beating. It's not anesthesia. I would claim that they're just not dead yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That seems like a great place now, to start. Well, okay. <laughs> now well, take my position and, and try to uh, you or talk about it with an atheist and who's going to agree with who quickly. Why, why would I? Who's going to form would I? friends that way? Like, why, why would I do that though? Even if, so, you, so you mentioned Habermas earlier. He, he kind of, he does, I don't know if he uses that as a cumulative case, but he just kind of says, hey, here's an interesting supplementation mm -hmm. for it. Yeah, you know, for, for the people who like that kind of thing. But I, I go back to scripture, 2 Corinthians 12, 3. Whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows. Paul is open to it. You're not. I side with Paul. I do think that you can be apart from the body. I don't think you function apart from the body. If I like some of what Eric believes and some of some of what Evan <laughs> believes, is there like a middle ground uh, between you guys? We're splitting. You can't be building. hot or cold. No. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> look at this guy. So, Thomas Aquinas with... tries to to split the difference, uh, uh, but uh, um, he seems to to make exception with divine intervention for a lot of these things that people want. Can I just go with uh, Oprah? Don't go with Oprah. Uh, I do not recommend. <laughs> and I think <laughs> we're, we're so close. I would just say we're, we're just so close. I think really the only difference is whether NDEs can happen and whether you're, you can function in an intermediate state and whether you need eyeballs to see or your soul has the capacity <laughs> itself. Whether souls die or we're, we're effectively immortal, um, whether transgenderism is possible, whether a, a abortion is uh, not killing a person. But I've already possible. responded to those. I think those are mischaracterizations of my view. Only if or, or, organicism is true. And I, I I would think that that requires you to make extra steps, and I don't. I think to. Genesis backs it up, but that's. I think y'all are gonna have to go get a beer and duke this out <laughs> yeah. on your own because we, we are so least, out of time. We've at least done our job of laying the laying some groundwork and putting out some words that people can Google and that's right. <laughs> go to Wikipedia and be like, oh, okay, I get it now. But um, Eric, we want to thank you very much for your time. Yes. Where can people you. find you? Uh, YouTube.com slash Eric Hernandez is probably where they can, uh, what they would want to see is stuff I've done, debates I've done, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Evan, where can people find you? Uh, First Lutheran Church. All right. I don't have a yeah. YouTube page. Go to Eric's. He's do he does great. Right here in this this building. Yeah. We so, agree. Um, Amen. Yeah. And 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 Eric's debate, uh, which I was able to moderate uh, between Matt Dillahunty and himself on uh, the existence of the soul. So that would be a good mm -hmm. place if it, it, to 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 listen to uh, these arguments. But um, Sarah, any last thoughts? Nope. Sarah, I'm from thoroughly confused. Sarah, outreach director <laughs> for young adults at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church. I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm at First Lutheran. Subscribe to us on the podcast feed. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. So and check out the website, HoustonTOT.com. It'll tell you about future events, all kinds of yep. exciting stuff. So. Yep. All right, guys. Well, until next time, we encourage you to question, question freely, <laughs> think deeply, and disagree as needed. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. See you later. See ya. <laughs>